I'm not afraid Through you the price is paid Through you there's victory Because of you my heart's free I am free Yes, I am free Everybody job bands and you all sounded great worshiping out there today too well what a nice looking group I'm just going to take you in for a minute so Pastor Tony and Pastor Travis were both supposed to be gone today so the plan was for me to fill in and life happened and they both came off the river so we talked we thought well you know the plan was for me to be here so so here I am as we kick this off today I got to tell you though on Wednesday, we had our kickoff for youth group. Uh, it, was, uh, it was a dinner uh, put together. It was a potluck, but it was really put together by some great volunteers. And I just want you to know, we had 40 junior and senior high school students here to kick that off. It was incredible. And I can tell you at least 12 names of people who, who couldn't come for one reason or another. So we talked about what Sundays and Wednesdays nights look like and... Uh, there's some great volunteers that help with that, preparing food, uh, leading lessons, just being there, and uh, it was incredible. Uh, someone counted 93 people, if you count the, the students, their parents, and their young, the ones that had to bring younger siblings, 93 people here Wednesday. It was incredible. Thank God for that. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today. The I'll, I'll mention the youth through this, but, but what it takes to... Um, live as a follower of Jesus and, and what it really means. And I'm going to start off by talking about a couple uh, New Testament words that, that you, or I should say Bible words that if you've ever been in the Bible, you've read these words. And so they w might not be new to you, but if you've never opened your Bible, these, these are two new words. So the very first one is rabbi. Uh, we open our New Testament, we, we, we see the word rabbi. Jesus was, was referred to as a teacher. He was referred to as a rabbi. And that's what a rabbi is, is. If I could just put it simply, it's a teacher. But in that culture, it carried a little more weight than just teacher. The rabbi was a, a wise sage, someone to go to if you had family problems, 
someone to go to um, if you had uh, questions about your future because the rabbi knew scripture better than anyone else. And so since our lives should be deep-seated within scripture, people would go to the rabbi and say, what does this look like? And then uh, oftentimes when the rabbi would teach, people would, would come and gather and, and hear the teaching. So I'm going to mention a rabbi several times today. So just remember, teacher. The other word we're going to spend a little bit more time on is this term disciple. And it's another a word we see in the Bible a lot. We, in, in, in Christianese, we talk about discipleship, but, but what does it look like? What is a disciple? I have some definitions in your worship folder there. And uh, Miriam Webster says, one who accepts and assist in spreading the doctrines of another. So we're going to talk about discipleship from a biblical perspective today, but discipleship can spread out farther than that. The Oxford Dictionary says a follower or student of a teacher, leader, or philosopher. I think we're now we're getting a little closer to what we see in the Bible with that definition, but my favorite definition is by this author and teacher named Ray Vanderland. And he has this great series uh, about discipleship. And, and he used to uh, take people to the promised land. He would take people to Israel, take people to that whole region, and they would walk it, and he would teach them. And there's videos out there about it, really great stuff. But, but this is how he defined disciple. And I think it's a really great uh, jumping off place for us. Someone who wants to be what the rabbi is. I think that's really powerful. And to help us understand that, let's talk about the education system during Jesus' time, actually before and after Jesus' time, but let's, let's look at that education system. When kids were five years old, they went to school, essentially. The, the focus of this school, it was called Bet Safar, uh, which meant house of book. The purpose of this was for them to, to learn how to read, how to write, and to learn scripture. And from five to ten, they went to this, this school. And at the end of it, most of them had the entire Torah memorized. Now, when I say Torah, what am I talking about? If you were to open up your Bible to the first five books of the Old Testament, that's the Torah. They, these 10-year-olds would have that memorized. Now, at 10 years old, one of, one of two things happened. The girls went back home. They didn't go to school anymore. They stayed at home, and they learned from their mothers, from their aunts, from their grandmothers. They learned how to manage the household. And the boys, most of them then went back uh, or didn't go to school any longer. They stayed with dad, and they learned the family trade. And if they didn't, if there wasn't enough work for the family trade, the dad would make arrangements with other tradesmen. So at that point, 10 years old, uh, they would begin to learn the family business or some kind of trade. It was time for them to go to work, essentially. If they w showed promise, if they did very well and that so far, then they could continue their education. They were invited uh, to, to go to school from 10 to 14, and they would go to Bet Talmud, uh, excuse me, Bet Talmud. It meant house of learning. I've heard, I've read in several places, and I don't know who first started this, and it sounds like they all quote each other, but these students were the best of the best. They were the ones who showed the promise. So they were, at this point, they would continue their schooling, and they would begin to learn the rest of what we call the Old Testament. Uh, and they would memorize large portions of that. Some of them would memorize the entire, what we call the Old Testament. And they were taught to be curious about Scripture. And, and they were taught to, to always be curious about what God's Word meant in our lives. And they were taught to answer questions with questions. Do you know that person? I mean, does that person drive you nuts? I mean, you go and you need something from them, and, 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 and they, they don't answer your question. They just answer it. Well, there was a school for that once upon a time. The rest of us, we've just picked it up along the way. But, but that's, that's what that school looked like. And then at the age of 14, almost all of them did go to work at that point. The best of the best of the best, and again, I don't know who started with that phrase, but everyone grabs onto it. Those who showed even more promise could potentially go on to more schooling. And this was called Bet Midrash, or House of Study. 
And how this worked is they would go to a rabbi. Remember that word, teacher? They would go to a rabbi and say, can I be your student? Can I follow you? And the rabbi would quiz them. And, and he would ask them lots of questions, not just about their knowledge of scripture, but what the rabbi was trying to do, see part of being a rabbi, is you wanted your students to become just like you. You didn't want them just to learn God's word. You wanted them to become just like you. So the, the rabbi would question them to figure out if they could become just like them. And it was, it was really cool the way they would do this, is they would ask them a question. But here's how it worked. They would begin quoting scripture, and they would give like three verses, and the question would be about the fourth verse, which they never quoted. So the student should know what that fourth verse is or, or what's next and be able to answer the question. So there's a reason the best of the best of the best. Very few people got to do that. But if the rabbi said, oh, you're going to be a good fit with me, you, you know enough, I think we're going to bond well, then he would say, come follow me. Take, on, uh, take my yoke upon you. Now, several weeks ago, Pastor Tony had a couple yokes out here. A yoke is this wooden, they're, they're hanging on the wall over by the cross, so if you've never seen one, uh, when we're done, don't do it now, please stay in your seats. Uh, you can go see what a yoke looks like. But it was this wooden piece that went on an animal, or if there were two animals working together, uh, they would put on there and they would pull. They would, they would pull a plow, they would pull a wagon, they would pull something, and that was the yoke. The yoke that these rabbi put upon people were, was you're going to be just like me. I'm going to teach you everything I want you to know about life, and you're going to become just like me. If they were accepted, when that was, would happen, the family was excited. So the, their family, their friends, the community elder would gather, and they would give them a blessing, something like this. May you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. Have you ever been standing around talking to someone, and, and you, have, you have a small child running around, and when they're running around, it's kicking dirt up on you. That's the principle here. May you, may you be so close to your teacher that you can become everything like him. Now, scholars uh, currently, uh, or for years now, have been arguing about whether that was really the blessing or not. Some of them think it was more like, uh, may you be powdered in, in, in the dust of your rabbi. In other words, when the rabbi would sit to teach and they would sit around uh, the rabbi, may, may you be so close to him that the the dust that fall off his feet, may it cover you, kind of like you would, you would powder yourself with makeup. So we're not going to get into, we're not going to argue today about which blessing it was. We're just going to go with the fact that the blessing was, may you be so close to your rabbi, you become just like him. That, that's the, what the blessing was all about. So check this out. That, that's what it looked like culturally. That's what it looked like for them. Jesus, being called a teacher and a rabbi, he did things a little differently. He handpicked his disciples. Remember, dis potential disciples went and asked, can I follow you? Jesus went to people and said, follow me. It was completely backwards. He didn't quiz these 12 disciples. He just went out and said, hey, let's go. We have a job to do. Come follow me. Matthew 4, 19 and 20. He's, he's talking to Simon and Andrew while they're fishing. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately, they left their nets and followed him. Immediately, they left their nets and followed him. That has blown my mind for a long time. And then he goes and he, he meets James and John, and the exact same thing happens. Come, follow me. And they drop their nets. They quit work. They just walk away. Uh, there was another time he was talking to a couple disciples, John chapter 1, and, and they're, they're like, where are you staying? And he said, he said to them, come, and you will see. And they went and they hung out with him. So as a new Christian, I struggled with this a lot. W what do you mean he walked up and said, come follow me, and they just left their father, their family, they just left their job. It's like, man, there's work to be done. Where are you going? Someone's got to help with these nets. Someone's got to take care of these fish. But they just walked away, and that just blew my mind, and I struggled with it. Well, as I studied, and I, and I looked at more scripture, uh, there, we have more answers here. We can look at this culturally. Uh, we can look at their belief system. Uh, it wasn't that they just walked off the job. Uh, as we look at other scripture, other passages of the New Testament, we can see that they had had interactions with Jesus before that. But this was a tremendous opportunity for their family. And I've often thought, what did their dad say? 
oh great i got it it's like a, you, you lost my 10 millimeter socket or something didn't put my tools away i'll take care of that i think it would have been a tremendous honor for them i think it would have been an incredible honor for them to say you know my son gets to go follow a rabbi follow a teacher and that's what's fascinating about this you've probably caught this already Every one of his disciples that Jesus handpicked, well, they had a job. They were the working class, which tells us they weren't the best of the best of the best. They didn't already have a rabbi. They weren't chosen to continue their education system. They were just said, hey, you got to go to work now. Go learn your family trade. And they all went to work. So, so this is uh, absolutely backwards, too. Jesus wasn't following the standards of the education system. He handpicked people for purpose. And as we think about discipleship, uh, there's two core building blocks I really want to mention today. And I think you'll see how these come together. It's community and God's word. Two core building blocks of community and God's word. So the disciples traveled everywhere that the rabbi went. They didn't just stay in one town. They traveled and they taught. And so the disciples were learning how to be just like that rabbi. They were learning God's word. They were learning his his mannerisms. I read one article that said, if for some reason the rabbi developed a limp, so did his disciples. They tried to be that much like him. They would begin limping to, to be like that. They would learn his mannerisms, his phraseology, his quirks. You've met people like that. They've worked together, lived together, been together so long that they can uh, finish each other's sentences. They they think the same. They act the same. Well, that's the intent of community. And so that's what the the rabbis tried to get from them is, is, is that kind of community. Jesus and his disciples lived in community too. I'm sure there was a large community, but a lot of times we think about the 12 that were closest to him. Uh, and so they would follow him, but there was something different. Uh, Jesus didn't expect them to walk with a limp. Jesus expected them to be who God created them to be. They traveled, they ate, they learned, they taught, and they fought like a family. It's incredible, though, the night before Jesus died, they're sitting around and having a meal together, and they've spent so much time together, and Jesus has taught them, and he passes on the baton. Eleven of those twelve men who were his students became partners, became partners in the work that Jesus was doing. John chapter 15, verses 15 and 16. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you. Let's go back to what the culture did. The students went to the rabbi and said, can I? Jesus went and said, to, went, went to them, the exact opposite, and said, follow me. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. As they shared life, as they shared community, as they shared God's word, they went out into the world and they applied it. Other rabbis were sitting around teaching their disciples, and Jesus taught, certainly, but he would teach as they were doing. So not only did they learn God's word, but they, they, they knew how to apply God's word, and that's how they became partners. The students became the masters, and they didn't even have to snatch the pebble from the master's hand. There's like one person that laughed at that. So once upon a time, there was a show called Kung Fu. Uh, Go look it up yourself. Okay, so that was the rabbi-disciple relationship during Jesus' time. Let's fast forward to present day. I have a question for you all. And there's a blank line there, and, and there's room around the blank line if you need more room. Here's my question for you. Who introduced you to Jesus? Take a minute, think about that. Think about the who, think about the what, the when, the where, the how. I'm going to to stand here and wait for you to write something down. Who was it? And and maybe some of you grew up in the church. So maybe it was a community that introduced you to Jesus. Or, Or maybe you learned about Jesus out on the streets. 
I have a friend who wrote me a letter. He learned more about Jesus. It wasn't the first time he heard about him in prison, in federal prison for drug charges. He wrote me a letter saying, Jesus is my Lord and Savior. It was incredible. Maybe some of you learned about Jesus when you were at the end of your rope. Whatever it was, write that down. So in grade school, we were taught to ask uh, who, what, when, where, how, and why. But when I asked you who introduced you to Jesus, I left out the why. And I want to give you the why. Why did they introduce you to Jesus? Why did they introduce you to Jesus? When I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior, I accepted the role to make disciples. Hold on. Wait a minute, Jim. What do you mean? I'm not good enough to do this. I'm not good enough to make someone a disciple. I don't have the skills. I don't have the abilities. I don't have the knowledge. I've had conversations with some of you. Some of you have had conversations with me, and the, the gist of the conversation is I'm not good enough. I'm not prepared enough. That's not me. I would argue with you, though. I argue that whatever you know, Whatever your experience is, you are qualified to tell people about Jesus. Uh, after Thursday night service, Greg Jones walked up to me and said, I would add to that. He said, I would tell people that they are uniquely qualified because we all have our own story and our own story about Jesus is our own story and we have that to share. We all have something to give to someone else. Uh, Matthew 11, 28 and 30, when Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart and you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy to bear and the burden I give you is light. So if we think about the other rabbi, they didn't, the other rabbis didn't, didn't uh, tell their disciples, come and follow me and learn God's word. They said, come and follow me and learn God's word and become just like me. Have you met those people that are always right? I mean, two plus two is four. Can we all agree on that? I mean, did I get that right? But you know what? So is one plus three. They both equal four. But have you ever, have you ever met that person that said, no, there's only one right way? It's only two plus two. That's probably a really easy example, but have you met those people that, 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 that put that pressure on you in other ways? You can only do things my way. Maybe you've heard the phrase, it's my way or the highway. I mean, that's truly, we put that on people sometimes. But Jesus says, my yoke is lighter. You're going to learn God's word and become the person God created you to be. It's much, much different. After his death and resurrection, he came back and talked to his disciples. Matthew 28, 18 and through 20. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He gave them a job. Uh, we, if you've been around church for a while, we call this the Great Commission. It was a job that Jesus gave his disciples, and it's a job that we all have. So if, if part of my role as being a follower of Jesus is to make disciples, how do I do that? How do I make disciples? I mean, it's right there in the scripture. Go do this. How do I make disciples? I want to read from Acts chapter 2. This is the early church interacting with one another. This is the early church living in community. This is the early church uh, making disciples. Okay, so, so let's look at this. Acts chapter 2, uh, beginning with verse 42. And they voted, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Those first 11 men that I told you about who were disciples when Jesus passed the baton, they, 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 were, they were now partners with Jesus. They were, they were now teachers. They were, they were now, it was now their job. And, and so now we refer to them as apostles. The apostles are messengers. So they're out there making disciples, teaching people. And so that's, that's why it says apostles here. So it's those same 11 people that we've been talking about so far. A and more, of course, but, but we'll stick with those 11. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship community. That's what fellowship is. 
to the breaking of bread and, and prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and, all, and, and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as they had need. Circle that word need. That's really important. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food, food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their numbers day by day those who were being saved. The building blocks of discipleship are community and God's word. So I'm going to break this down. The question is, how, how do I make disciples? So what I'm going to try to do right now is marry what we saw the early church do with what, the, what we call the Great Commission, what Jesus told his disciples to do when he said, go, go make disciples. So I'm going to try to marry them with these, these two points, or these next points, I should say. First of all, to make disciples, I must be a disciple. I, I, I have to be devoted to God's word. Uh, let me ask this question. Is Jesus your savior? Is Jesus your rescuer? Man, that's, that's nice, isn't it? We have the Savior, the Savior. I'm rescued from sin. I'm rescued from my consequences. I, I, I'm rescued from my, my, well, I'm rescued from myself. I mean, we all want a Savior. We want a rescuer. But, but what about a Lord? I mean, I, I, I think we have to ask those things together. Is Jesus your Savior and Lord? See, that's, that's what being a disciple, I have to be a disciple. He committed himself to us. He gave him his whole self so that we can have that, make that commitment. And is he Lord of all of your life or part of your life? Because sometimes there's things we want to keep to ourselves. You know what? I'll be your follower, but you don't get this part of me. I'll be your follower, but you know what? I'm going to keep doing things the way I think they need to be done in this area of my life. So to make disciples, we have to be disciples. We have to be committed I can't lead someone to water if I don't know where the water is. I can't teach somebody God's word if I don't spend time in God's word. Next, we need to tell people about Jesus. We need to create the awe. Now, we talk about miracles in, in our modern day, and, and a lot of us talk about things that we've seen that were miracles, and, and I've been guilty of this. I think true miracles aren't as, as they don't happen as often as what we think they do or talk about them, in other words. And, and we tend to use this word miracle often. So I, I used to do it when I talk about the miracle of birth. I mean, if you've ever seen a baby born, it, it truly looks miraculous. And then, so I would talk about the, the miracle of birth, and, and it's a phenomenal experience, but is it really a miracle? God created that. It happens within the norm. This is how it's supposed to happen, and it happens. As, as a, a paramedic who, who teaches other people to be EMTs or paramedics, I can teach how to deliver a baby in the field. And I can teach that forwards and backwards. Sadly, I never had the opportunity in, in my over 25 years. I never had the opportunity to do that. But the biggest thing I teach them, you're there to catch because mom does all the work because that's the process that God created, and it's all normal stuff. So we think of it as a miracle, but truly, it falls within all the bounds of God's creation. So I think we use this term miracle a little too loose sometimes. So, so maybe the all we create isn't by doing a miracle. Maybe it's just by the way we handle ourselves. You don't have to leave this country to go make disciples. You can do it right here. Well, for some of you in your own houses, at, at work, with your hobby, in your neighborhoods. We have the opportunity, and we can live our lives in a way that people say, man, there's something about you that I want. They, they can look at you and say, how in the world did you ever get through that? How in the world did you keep your calm when that was happening? Ah, that's the awe. They look at you and say, oh, I'm in awe of you. They may not use that word, but, but truly, they're in awe of you at that moment. How did you overcome that? And that's our opportunity. Let me tell you about Jesus little side note real quick i i said those exact same things thursday night and then friday morning i'm in a i'm in a pretty intense conversation with someone and he looks at me and says that very same thing how did you ever get through this in your life ah it was jesus 
So I, I, I wrote this down, and I told you guys about it, but at the same time, that's, that's really how we, we need to live. And I took that opportunity, and I thought of every one of you, well, maybe not my name, but, but I thought of being here with you on Thursday and today because this is exactly what it is. This is how we create awe. And then we lead people to Jesus. Uh, it says the Lord added to their numbers daily. So we're saved by grace through faith. There's no doubt about that. We hear the good news. We accept the good news. We speak the good news. In other words, we share the good news. And then we're called to action. And when we experience Jesus, when we meet Jesus, we're called to do something. And one of the first things we're called to do is baptize. That's why Jesus told his disciples to do that. One of the most incredible things I've, I've got to do in life is one of my best friends. One of them's here today, another one's not. But the one that's not here, I, I baptized him in the Atlantic Ocean. It was the first time I ever seen the Atlantic. He says, when we get there, I want you to baptize me. Absolutely. And right there, we walked out. We walked out to waist deep, and it was, it was incredible. There were people around. Some people were looking. Some people weren't, but our friends were there, and there were tears. Why was that such an incredible experience? Because his commitment to the Lord deepened when we did that. See, baptism isn't an option. Baptism is the next step. And so we need to lead people to that. We need to lead people to make that commitment. Then we can share life with each other. Uh, The early church, they were all in this together. The needs of the community were more important than than their own desires. And so we see that, that they sold things to meet each other. I had you circle that word need. I'm not talking about socialism here. What I'm talking about is someone else's need becoming more important than than what I want out of life. Needs are more valuable than wants. And so it went something like this. Oh, you're hungry? You know what? I don't have anything to share with you right now, but I'll go sell something so you can have something to eat. Oh, you need something to wear? I think I have something that'll work. Let me give it to you. That's what community is. And so they would share everything that they had. They would share in God's word. They would share in communion. And that happens here at Adventure. The question is, are you involved in it? Well, how does that happen at Adventure? Well, we we have men's breakfast. We have women's breakfast. We have small groups. We have classes. We have Adventure Land. We have youth group. Uh, We have uh, small groups. We have Bible studies. Adventure does what the early church did. My question for you is, are you involved in it? What are you doing to create community and spread God's word? And then as I make disciples, I can find relief in knowing that I'm not alone. They praised God with glad hearts. See, from the outside, looking in, they were a new religion. They were sinners. They were wrong. Some people looked at them like the enemy. Some people thought they deserved to be put to death because of that. But they praised God anyway. They were, they were thankful for this community of Christ. They were thankful for what God has given them. They were thankful for the relationships that they had. And if we keep reading the book of Acts, we're going to find that these men, these women, these, this, this new church, they were rejected. And some of them were indeed put to death. But they looked at the big picture. They didn't look at the here and the right now. They had glad and thankful hearts because the community that we're talking about isn't just about us that are here together right now. This community is about a worldwide church. This community is about spending eternity with Jesus, and they understood that. This community extends what I can see with my eyes or hear with my ears. This community is all about being God's people. So they kept the main thing, the main thing. And their focus was on the promises of the peace for the future. And they found relief in that. So all this, does all this sound too hard to you? Is this a yoke that you can handle? I mean, if we think about what, what Jesus is asking us to do today, if you still doubt yourself, if you still doubt your ability to reach out to someone else and tell them about Jesus, to, to if your ability to make disciples, then I hope that you can grab at least grab onto this. See, Jesus picked, remember he handpicked, Jesus picked common people to lead the early church. 
and he will use me today. Ephesians chapter 2, 8 through 10 says, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created... Oh, let me go back to that. Circle that. Underline it. Star it. You are God's masterpiece. Look at the person next to you and say, you are God's masterpiece. That was weak. Come on, that's good news. That was weak. All right, so you are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ. He has created us anew in Christ. So, underline to the end, we can do good things he planned for us long ago. And I like what the message does here. Right at the end it says, work we had better be doing. I like the strength that went with that. We, we have a job to do when we accept Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Uh, we were rescued from our sin for a purpose. So what's the job? What's the work that Ephesians is talking about here? Well, let me ask you this. What's your spiritual gift? If you don't know, there's a class coming up. Sign up when we're done. Find out what your spiritual gifts are. What are your skills, talents? What are your abilities? Those are things that you can share with other people. If you were to ask the youth group, what's their favorite thing about youth ministry? I bet, and I didn't ask them, so I'm speculating. I bet most of them will tell you, hanging out, just being together. I get here 30 minutes early on Sundays and Wednesdays just so they can hang out. That's community. I bet if we were asking them, okay, what, what is it next? They're going to tell you the games and the activities. Do you know my weakest area in youth ministry? Games and activities. I stink at that. And it's one of their favorite things. So that's not my spiritual gift. That's not within my abilities. So what do I need? Well, I either need to have people who are good at that come around me, or I need to just suck it up and figure out how to make it work. Because that's what we do. Uh, speaking of youth group, want to know what makes me sad? Oh, too bad I'm going to tell you anyway. What really makes me sad is when our kids age out, most of them leave the church. They've lost their community. They're now too old to come to youth ministry. They're too old to come to what we do with the youth group. And, and, they've, and they don't have a community other than that youth group, so they go and they find another community somewhere else. They're not connected. They don't feel like they have a place. And if I can just be honest with you all, we need to do better. We need to make sure they have a community. We need to make sure they have a place. But it's not just the youth. It's visitors. It, it's new believers. It's the people you know or the people you're sitting with that only commit to Jesus one hour a week when you show up here. We need to get them involved, all of them, in community. And if you're not involved in community, man, you're missing out. You're missing out on something incredible. And I encourage you to do that. So, last question I have for you. Who are you influencing? People are watching you, I promise. Here, outside of here, people are watching you, and we need relationships now. We need to build a community so that we have the opportunity to say, let me tell you about Jesus. So we have the opportunity to tell people, here's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And when I'm living as a disciple... I know Jesus will save lives. Mine, yours, and theirs. And who do I mean by theirs? Anyone who sees you. Anyone you come in contact with. Let's make disciples. Let's build community. Let's share God's word. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the people that you put into our lives to be the examples to us, for the people that, that are your disciples that came into our lives and, and showed us how to be disciples. We're, we're so grateful for that. We're so grateful for the model you gave us, and we're so grateful for the opportunities to share your word. And so as we sit here together, I just pray that, that your spirit will speak to us, that, that you'll help us to understand who it is we need to reach out to. What is the example that we're setting for other people? 
And, and Lord, if, if, if I'm not being the disciple you've called me to be, I pray that this will be an opportunity that, that your, your spirit draws me closer to you and I have that desire to learn more about community, to learn more about your word and to share that with the people I'm sitting with, the people I work with, the people I see on a regular basis. Lord, I just pray we'll do all these things for your glory and so that you will add to our numbers daily. We humbly ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. See, Jesus was the perfect example for us. He made that commitment when he allowed himself to die on the cross. And so now at this point in our, our, our service, we, we practice communion together. And you don't have to be a member here. You don't have to have a special uh, class. If Jesus is your Lord and Savior, this time is for you to share with him. It's something that happens globally on a regular basis. And so now we get to remember what he did. So here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to think about your relationship with Jesus. Use this time to remember that bread was his body was broken. The, the juice represents that, that he gave up his life so that we can have community and the opportunity to know him better. So the communion's on your table. If you've never taken it here before, there's a, a real thin film on top. You can pull that back to get to the bread. The next film gets you to the juice. But think about that, your relationship, where you stand in community and knowing God's word. And we'll come back and close together in just a moment. Hey, once again, we're glad that you're here. Jim, thank you. Dude, that was good stuff. Um, as we get ready to take off, let me just encourage you to, uh, again, just be thinking about, do you, have, do you have the network around you that you need? Do you have the, the elements in your life that you need to continue to grow? Not just, not just show up, but I mean actually dig in and grow and mature and I mean we never get there so it's a constant state of, of sorting through and doing that I, I just want to really encourage you man if you don't have some other people who are chasing God around you uh, trying to do life with God around you make sure you you've got those people and there are people in this room uh, that would love to be those people in your life and uh, that might mean that you hop into to one of the groups that's starting up it may mean that you hop into one of the classes again there's, there's a bunch of different ones. I know Steph's getting ready to run a Love God, Love Others class. That one's fantastic. Tony's going to do his needs, her needs. So if you guys are looking at, uh, at some marriage stuff and just want to kind of enrich and focus in there, those opportunities are there. Again, lots of opportunities. Just make sure that, that you've got those elements that you need in your life.
Okay, so we love you. That's uh, that's part of the reason why we gather together. That's part of the reason why we make sure all this stuff is available, and uh, and we keep challenging and encouraging each other and praying for each other and moving forward. So, uh, love you guys. I hope you have a great week. Keep praying for Tony and Steph as they go through their whole family this week as they go through that loss, and uh, clean up after yourselves. And we'll see you later. All right, bye. <laughs>